Howdy, welcome to the Maze Mastercast. I'm your host, Ben Wiggins. It's a beautiful day in Aggieland, and we are fired up for today's discussion. As Principal and Director of Financial Planning for Paragon Financial Advisors, Stephen McGee brings valuable expertise in risk management, retirement, tax, college, and estate planning strategies. Stephen earned both his bachelor's and master's degrees from Mays Business School at Texas A&M University and was named the 2008 winner of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes National Bobby Bowden Award. Stephen was the quarterback from 2004 to 2007 at Texas A&M under coaches Dennis Franchoni and Mike Sherman. He was also a two-time recipient of the All Big 12 First Academic Team and was given the Aggie Hart Award. After college, Stephen played in the NFL for the Dallas Cowboys and eventually in the Canadian Football League as well. Stephen has since continued his education and has earned his Certified Financial Planner designation. He hails from Burnett, Texas, and now lives in College Station, Texas with his wife, Brittany. They are expecting their first child, a girl, in August 2022. Let's get into it. We welcome Stephen McGee to the show. Thanks for joining us here today, Bob. Uh, thank you, Bob. <clears throat> Appreciate sorry, it. Sorry I'm uh, running late. <laughs> oh, you're, so, you're so bad. You're so bad. The head ball <laughs> coach is breathing down my neck now. Uh, tell us a little bit about your academic. Let me, uh, let me take another shot at that. Jeez, old peasy Martha, <laughs> Bob. Jeez, old peasy Martha. I, I'm gone now. <laughs> tell us a little bit more about your academic journey. And specifically, how do you feel it was different for you as a star athlete, as a football player, what do you think that was, how was, how was your journey? Different? Well, I appreciate that you added star in there. There, there was <laughs> nothing uh, stardom about my athletic career, certainly, but you know, athletes have to juggle the time constraints and you know this as well as anybody of, you know, we're fully committed to trying to prepare to be as successful as we can on the field, which entails obviously the workouts, the, you know, eating healthy, getting the right amount of sleep and, uh, but then, you know, more specifically for quarterbacks, it's it's very important that you do the amount of time and preparation that it takes to be successful on the field mentally. And and that takes a lot of time watching film. And so you throw in all that and then you got to go to class and you're at Mays Business School and there's there can be challenges there. Right. And, and fortunately for us, we had a bevy of resources uh, in the athletic department of, of people that could help. Right. And, you know, say, hey this is how you need to prepare to be successful for this class or that class. And that certainly helps. But then I think having great classmates as well. I mean, that's, I, I look back at my time at Mays and I think a lot about the people and it came into play for me with having people that I trusted and that would take time to invest in me as a, as a student. Like, hey, you know, you missed this class. This is what you really need to focus on or a professor that did the same thing. And so um, all those, all those things kind of collide and it becomes a time management game. Yeah. I want to roll back to something you, you were talking about, specifically the quarterback perspective, watching film as a receiver, you watch film and it's mostly just like, what, so what can I expect in, you know, press coverage? Like what, you know, what are they going to roll to after the snap as a quarterback, you got 10 times more stuff to think about than a receiver does. And all of this stuff happens in a second. You take the snap and you see what's happening. And in a second, you got to figure out, all right, what's the first read? What's the second read? They have a hot throw, like anything like that. What was the hardest part of that for you? Well, you know, it's, of course, I may be a little bit biased here, but I think it's the most difficult position in all of sports uh, to play next year. be surprised. It's, uh, it's extremely challenging. And I think even if you were to compare that to you know, the everyday jobs that are out there playing quarterback would have to rank up there with, with some of the most difficult, uh, it, it, there's so much pressure mm -hmm. because there's so many eyes that are on you. Uh, if you have a bad play, you're on the front of the newspaper, right? Yeah. And the reality is that most CEOs and, and most business leaders don't have that level of pressure. Most yeah. don't, not to say that all don't, um, it playing quarterback is challenging because it takes an extreme athletic ability, right? You have to yeah. say, hey, God gave me the ability to uh, be 6'3", or he didn't, right? So you have to have that. That's kind of like the entry exam, but then you've got to be able to think quickly, right? I mean, it's like you said, you have seconds to, to get the ball out and you're trying to get your entire team lined up. You're trying to slide protections pre-snap, see what the defense is doing coverage-wise so you can get through your read. 
uh, handle hot throws, make sure guys know uh, what they're doing after you break the huddle. And then, oh, by the way, when you say set hut, you've got these guys over there lined up trying to knock your head off that are 6'5", 280 pounds that run four fives. Yeah. And so that's all coming at you. You have cameras on you, you have fans yelling at you. And to be able to block it all out and trust your preparations to try to slow the game down is what it all comes down to. And one of my coaches used to always say that uh, the difference between good and great is just being consistently good, right? So make the layup, right? And and that's what the guys like Tom Brady do so well. They make the gimmies, uh, they hit the guy in the flat to get four yards, get second and six instead of second and 10. And that ultimately helps a play caller and helps your offense succeed. I heard virtuosity defined once as doing the common uncommonly well. That sounds like what you're describing. It was it was in the it was in the context of CrossFit actually. It was like do the like do the air squat well, <laughs> like do the deadlift well, and then you know that translates to the fancy stuff like you know muscle ups and snatches and all of that stuff. But uh, I don't know, that's an interesting perspective. I like that. How many muscle ups can you get? I bet you're. Oh gosh. You know, it's funny. I'm I'm not great at bar muscle ups. I could probably do, I, I don't know, maybe f- I, m- f- totally fresh, maybe seven. But on rings, which are like th- like in the community, there it's everybody says rings are harder just because it's there's it's not fixed. Yeah. Um. I like I I think with rings I could probably I could probably do ten fresh. I don't know. You've been doing muscle ups? No. Yeah, I, I can do yes, zero. <laughs> I, I don't have the ability. I, I know, so I'm not a CrossFitter, but I have friends that that do it, and um, it it really fascinates me that community. Like that, people love CrossFit. It's culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, no uh, question. I believe it. And so the muscle up is the one that always had shoulder problems. And as a quarterback, we oh. never really lifted above the above the shoulders, right? So you oh. do your cleans to here. Okay, okay. But you never would do like the the full the, overhead snatch. Huh. And so muscle ups are just. I feel like I'm permanently for life. Like I'm still protecting my shoulders. I, I don't need to throw a ball obviously anymore, but right. I'm still sensitive to that. So I will never do a muscle up problem. Okay. Okay. What do you do for exercise now? I mean, clearly you keep in shape. Uh, you know, I mow my grass. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> hey, clearly you've already heard that from one of my neighbors. I'm not going to name. Right. Um, but it's, I, I try to get 45 minutes a day in and you know, I think as an athlete, it's hard to escape working out, right? Like it's it's so ingrained in your daily activities. It's almost as if for me now that if I don't get a workout in, it's like I don't, I didn't eat food. It affects your head game. Yeah, it affects your headspace. Like you need that. And then for me, it's a great, like with, with the way, like there's so many like moving parts right now in the market. It's like days like today, like going at the end of the day to the gym, getting my 45 minutes in before I go home, it allows me to decompress, right? Mm -hmm. And just digest the day, like get it out, um, have a great workout. And then that way I can go home and plug in with, with my wife and be, be more present. Though I think she would argue I'm not all. (laughs) I've, I've, I've heard that one too about myself. You talked a little bit about the balance of football and the classroom. What, what hacks did you use to find a little Piece in your life, like to find, I mean, we talk about work-life balance or sports life balance, sports academic life balance. What, what did you do to center yourself? That's a great question. And I think when I look back from my athletic days, playing days, both at A&M and, and then in Dallas and, and some other places, I, I, I would say that my biggest struggle was the overemphasis on the success or lack thereof, I had on a field, right? That mm-hmm. uh, that identity that's tied to what you're doing, yeah. Um, and and not enjoying the moment as much, right? And I think that that's so important. And if I've had or if I've I've grown in any way, I think my wife would would tell you this, and she's the one that's seen me the most over that time frame. Obviously, is that I was probably uh, too too heavily tied into being great at that, right? As opposed to smiling more, having more fun, enjoying the moments that came. And so if I have regrets, it's it's certainly that. And so I didn't do a good job of having that place where I could go or that group of people that I trusted enough uh, in those situations to like let back and just be me, right? And yeah. I was just too too tight, too wound up. And it's it's hard enough playing quarterback, right? And under the microscope <laughs> yeah. that you got to have those places where you can go to 
um, to release. And now, like I, I, I mentioned to you uh, this last weekend, playing in a member guest golf tournament, right? Drinking some beers with my buddies on the golf course, even though it's 104 degrees, it's a great escape, right? Yeah. I mean, that, it's, it's a fun release and it's needed. You can't just be doing work 24 seven. And so I wish I could say I had better avenues whenever as a player to have fun, right? And, and, and enjoy those years, but I didn't. And I think I look back, I, I don't know, you could always say, you know, what would have been, I, I think I would have relaxed more. And I think if I would have relaxed more as a, as a quarterback, um, I would allow my ability to come out more. And that was one of the things mm -hmm. that my coach always used to tell me is, um, Jason Garrett in Dallas, like, McGee, just go out there and have some fun today. Like, <laughs> pretend like, <laughs> Pretend like you're in Burnett, Texas right now. Just cut that thing loose. Like just, just throw it up. Rip it and rip it. Exactly. Do you think you, if you had, if you had cut loose a little bit more, you think you would have gotten in more trouble? Did, did you get in trouble? I, I really did. I, I didn't get in a lot of trouble. No. Um, I think I had one house party in college and we called it Camo Crunk Fest. Camo Crunk Fest. And it was crunk. Perfect. Like it was a great, but it was one party. <laughs> like I, it wasn't an every weekend thing. And so, uh, Potentially, uh, you know, we didn't win a lot of football games and generally when you don't win, if there's anything that goes down, you're more likely to get in trouble. Whereas if you're winning, you're a little bit more insulated from that. I feel like, you know, winning kind of, not to say it's perfect uh, causation there, but it's certainly, I was, a, I was very straight and narrow kid. Like I was not. I heard a story about a BMW. Well, there's other, there's, yeah, there, there's some, <laughs> there's some thievery. So. <laughs> you know, um, you, you, don't, you don't have to tell the story. Well, no, it's it's a good story. So, so I there was a key fob. We were at we had a, a media day at the Bright facility, and Mike Sherman was our head coach. It was my senior year. Yeah. And someone says, "Hey, hey, McGee, is this your key fob?" And I looked at it, and I knew it wasn't immediately, but I just started thinking. I said, "Yes, it is." So I lied. <laughs> I lied. And so they gave me the key, and I knew it was Coach Sherman's car. Nice. And so, you know, I. One of those moments as a kid, like you're just like, man, what are, what are we gonna do? Like, where we, like, what restaurant are we going to? We're gonna ride around campus. How do we make the most of it? Well, it, in that moment, I decided that we wanted to drive that car into the indoor facility. So we had the you know the indoor bubble, <laughs> and um, one of Coach's messages that week was, um, you know, what kind of intestinal fortitude do you have? And as a man, is it you know jelly beans, eel, or 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 marshmallows? And so I put marshmallows on his car, and. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. And so we're going out to practice and, and I forget who we were playing that week, let's say Oklahoma State or, or what have you. And we're stretching and his car is parked in the end zone with the <laughs> the flashers going on. Well, typical right. Mike Sherman fashion, he can walk into a place fully aware that his car is parked there, but not just completely acknowledge ignore it, it. Yeah. and not smile. Right. Well, we're all chuckling like little girls, you know, we're just <laughs> like, ah, you know, enjoying our time and stretching. And so ultimately like we're practice starting. And so they they got to move it out. We don't get we never get our satisfaction of the moment. He just never acknowledged it. Calls up the team and he says, uh, "Hey gentlemen, like here's here's what we need to do. You know, this week to be successful. Of course, we had finished practice. We're all sweaty, tired, and uh, he goes, "Okay, guys, uh, one more thing. Let me teach you guys a little side piece here. If you're ever going to do anything in life, make sure you go the full the full mile. Like don't don't just do a little bit. Go all the way. Complete the deal. Here's here's an example, guys." If you're gonna steal someone's car, don't <laughs> don't drive it into an indoor and park it, turn on the flashers and like chuckle like it's real funny. It's not. It's it was take that car, drive it to the middle of University of Texas intersection, turn on the flashers, take the key, throw it in the drain, and walk <laughs> off. That is a man that does the job to completion. Now, with that, know that anytime that you do something, there's going to be a reaction from that event. Like you're gonna be held accountable for that. And so just know that people that d took action today will be held accountable. Break it down. We break it down. Ryan Tannehill and I are walking around the side of the building, yeah. coming in, you know, the, the, the Kyle Field door entry mm -hmm. and whose car is parked right there with no tires on it, on center blocks. <laughs> Perfect. Mine. Nice. <laughs> My car. Uh, that I should have been driving. My my locker had been cleaned out. Uh -huh. They had put a, a Texas player's uh, jersey and name on my on my locker. Everything was gone. Yeah. My my tires are in the locker room, plumped up. Everyone's taking pictures with my car. Um, 
I learned my lesson that day. Don't mess with Coach Sherman. Okay, fair enough. I had a lot of respect for Coach Sherman, and I only I only really met him once, and it was when he was firing me <laughs> because <laughs> you know almost all of us got let go when they had that staff transition. But what I respected about it was he did it himself. He like I walked into the room, and we only talked for I don't know ten minutes, you know, about just kind of what the what the journey had been like, and he asked me some questions, and I asked him a couple of questions. And then he said, hey, man, I just, you know, I want to let you know those positions are going to get filled. Like, I don't want there to be any ambiguity about it. And I wanted to talk to you about it myself. And mm. like, it was only 10 minutes, but, but he did that with, you know, probably 20 people. And, uh, you know, it's a, I mean, it's a bad deal, but, but big respect for the way that he handled it. And yeah. that guy always had my respect. You, you talked a little bit about uh, what Jason Garrett said to you. Once you get up to that level of the game, what does what does life look like and how much does that in terms of you, you talked a little bit about the mental commitment watching film all of the extra stuff like how much time off the field do you have to spend studying more or less what does that distribution look like yeah you know it's it is interesting that culturally different head coaches ask differently and treat their star players differently like it's mm. it's in the nfl it's a business and so um you know, ultimately, is if you get the job done on the field, they're not going to to grind you about your work habits away from it, right? Now, on the flip side, if you're not getting it done on the field and they can see that your work habits away from it aren't getting it done, then that's going to be reason for them to, to let you go. And so, um, you know, it, it was fun being in Dallas specifically because I had Jason Garrett and Wade Wilson who had played, you know, 15, 20 years each at the quarterback position and that were then the offensive coordinator and quarterback coach in the room with Tony Romo, who played a long time and had a great career. And then John Kidna, another guy that played, I don't know, 18, 19 years in the NFL as a quarterback as well. And so you had this plethora of knowledge at that position and what it took to be successful. And yet I would tell you that each one of them was very different in their approach, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I can't say that there's one size fits all. Tony's um, greatness was that he could improvise and he was just laid back and he could, you know, find a way to make something happen. And he wasn't going to be the Peyton Manning mold. Like he wasn't the first guy in the building and the last guy to leave. Like that's just not his MO. Yeah. Um, Kidna was a, was a hybrid. Jason Garrett was the guy that was there all day, right? He was the analytical one of the bunch. And, and Wade Wilson was the guy that was more quiet, uh, very, very quietly smart, brilliant though, had a lot to say when he did choose to speak, mm. uh, but offered a lot of humor, right? And mm. that witty um, intelligence too. And so you you learn that there's not one size fits all. Um, different guys were motivated differently and their approaches were differently and they coached us differently because of that, right? Sure. And uh, got to Houston, Gary Kubiak was uh, a drill sergeant on the quarterbacks. Like he held the, you know, multi-million dollar quarterback accountable just like he did the guy that was number 92 on the roster mm -hmm. in the off season. Yeah. So uh, that was not the way it was in Dallas. Like Romo did not get coached the same way in Dallas as I did or someone else. Like there was more of a white glove mentality there. Yeah. Kubiak, my first day, Matt Schaub, he got drilled in front of the whole team yeah. and he got called out. And so my point is to say there that there's different ways to, to lead a team and coach guys and uh, obviously, my my mo has always been that I'm the first guy there, the last guy. That, that's the only thing I know that if I can put as much time and energy into what I'm trying to do um, to give myself the best chance of being successful. It's not a guarantee that I'm going to be successful, obviously, but um, that was the mentality I took. You also talked a little bit about um, how you would have you would have had a little more fun. But what were the what were the hardest lessons to learn for you? What were the most painful ones? Yeah, you know, I think especially at A and M when when we when you were there with us, it, it, it was difficult because you know you're immature, you're a young kid, you're 21 years old, and you're not winning. And ultimately, even though you're a college athlete at that level of college football, there's an expectation that you need to win and everyone knows your name and there's that accountability and pressure. And so everyone's like, ah, that's the guy that needs to be benched or that's the, and so no matter what level that is, you gotta be able to handle failure, right? And it's difficult, it's challenging because you're like, man, I'm putting everything I have into this thing and yet we are not being successful. Yeah. 
And that energy to keep coming back and being the same person every day, right? The consistency that your team needs you to see. Like if you're if you're different when you're winning as when you're losing, you're gonna lose the respect of your guys. So you gotta have that same guy, same approach every day, day in and day out. Um, and you've gotta keep the guys on on board, right? You gotta keep this shit moving forward, even though you've had some setbacks, even though you've had some losses, that's difficult. And so yeah. I, I think about doing that at 24, 25 years old, it's difficult enough there, but man, at, at 20 or 21 years old, it's extremely challenging. And so I think learning to lose um, and being able to get back on the horse on Monday and start the whole thing over, it's, it's difficult. And that's a great learning lesson, right? I mean, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna lose. You've gotta, you've gotta learn how to handle those setbacks. And then I think equally, uh, you got to learn how to win too, right? When you do have successful moments, it's that challenge of, hey, it's Monday morning. I got to get back on the dang horse again because the next team doesn't care what you did last week. Yeah, It's a show me game, right? It's the mentality of the next play is the most important thing that's going to happen in my career and having that next play mentality. Yeah. If you could go back and give yourself one piece of advice other than, other than have fun, the day that you retired from the NFL, what, where you were right then, what would that advice be? Other than have fun and enjoy the moment, um, I I would have encouraged my past self to say, "Hey, no matter what happens, like don't be so fixated on securing a tenured career in the NFL because the future should be fine." Like we're not, you don't have to. Like, it's that it's that scary moment of like, "Hey, if I'm on the cut bubble, what happens then?" Like what, what does my future look like? I have no idea. Like I have invested 25, 26, 27 years of my life solely for playing quarterback. It's identity. Yeah. yeah. Like that's what I know. Like that's like, this is where I'm supposed to be. But what happens when the NFL says no more than what, right? It's that scary next step. Yeah. And I think that that unfortunately is in the back of a lot of guys' minds. And so as, as that was there for me, like I knew it's a numbers game as a backup quarterback. And so if you have injuries, like, there's things you can't control. And so having a having extra quarterbacks on your roster is a luxury, right? And so I would have just told myself, hey, it's gonna be great. Like, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna work out in the end. Like if I go back now and say, hey, uh, here's five more years in the NFL, you know, playing with Pittsburgh Steelers, I wouldn't take it today. Like, isn't that amazing? Like, I'd rather be where I am today than I would taking five more years in, in the league. But back when I'm on the cup bubble in the NFL, that's not, that's not the perception I took. Sure, right? It no. was like, this is it. Like what, what, what else could be as fun or as impactful or enjoyable as this? It feels like death, like a small, in a small way. Like it, they say every athlete dies, to, dies twice, you know, like when, when the end finally comes and it, it is, it is scary, man. People don't talk to you the same. Right. And uh, you know, you don't get invited to do the same stuff. You know, I didn't have the, I didn't have the type of career you did, but um but still, like there's your, the conversations feel different. It does. Like it, it, it changes in a million little ways. And some of it you expect and some of it you don't. Sometimes you look at somebody and you think, well, that's what it was about the whole time. It's a great point though. And, and we had this conversation last week, lost one of our former teammates, Marion Barber, a great NFL running back, Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. Um, and, it's really but it's that, it's that identity, it's, it's that, Hey, I've got to be the superstar, but what happens when the world starts treating me as a superstar and just as average Joe, right? And so, you know, preparing guys for that next journey, that next step, and it's difficult. Yeah, it's really tough. What is Paragon and what's your role with the company? So Paragon Financial Advisors is a RA firm based out of College Station, Texas, but we, we manage money. So we, we do the holistic financial planning services and, and investment management. I've been doing that since I got fired for the third time, I guess it was Ben. Uh, <laughs> see, I got fired in Dallas, Houston. I, I guess technically I didn't get fired in Canada, maybe. Let's let's hold, let's say that. <laughs> so let's say it was caught twice. But I, but I realized obviously that I needed to do something else. And, and so, you know, I always had this this interest in, and I was of course on the other side of the table of, of getting some money early in life and being, being trying to sold, right? Yeah. Um, so I started out in the broker dealer world and hated it. and it was all about sales. It wasn't about the people. Yeah. And ultimately people come to me because they trust me. They know me as a human being and they know my story. Um, and it was not, it's not about sales, right? It's, it's about 
how can how can I find a way to, to make a difference in this family's life? And it's an incredible responsibility. And so I knew I wanted to get out of the broker dealer world, which is more sales focused, in my opinion, in my experience, to an RA that could be a fiduciary on behalf of families, right? They've worked their entire lives to accrue this ne this nest egg and they're putting their trust and years and years of hard work into my hands. And how yeah. can I help them shepherd this and be a good steward with these resources? Sure. And so that's an incredible weight and responsibility, right? And it it's so rewarding though too, right? Because I get to have really in-depth, passionate conversations about all different types of topics that are important to a family and no one's the same. And so every conversation's different. So I don't have the same third down and 10 conversation every week. Uh, it's some, some, some new family and some new challenge and some new opportunity. And it, it, it really is um, re a rewarding experience. And so my, my role specifically on our team, we have a team-based approach. We, we try not to be, hey, I'm, I'm the jack of all trades. I do the trading, I do the financial planning recommendations, I do the, the compliance, the marketing, the sales. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm more, I, I do the director of financial planning. So we have people that work underneath me as well that, hey, you know, whether it's college planning or estate planning or tax planning, there's all, all different bevy of, of uh, topics that are gonna be covered in financial planning. I like to say it's, it's miles wide and yards deep. Um, and then we have people on our team that are gonna do more of the investment management you know, like your background. Um, so hundreds, hundreds of yards wide, but miles deep, right? And so those are more of like CFA minds. And so we try to specialize in areas uh, that we're passionate about and then deliver a, a better uh, in service to our clients by having a team approach. Yeah. What was the early journey with the company like? In what ways was the work the same as the really, really hard work you had been doing before that? And in what ways was it different in terms of not so much in terms of the consultative um, approach, the discussions with families and so forth, but the actual nuts and bolts of handling your job commitments. Does that question make yep. sense? Yeah, you know, the amount of overlap between the lessons you learn as an athlete, it's amazing. Like I see the, hey, you gotta be consistent in this job too, right? And, yeah, yeah. and I think the preparation matters, right? So it sets mm. you up for, being confident in all different types of, of conversations. And so, like I mentioned earlier, clients are all different. And so that conversation that you are having could be a, a subject that you studied on a year or two years ago, but yeah. now it's coming into play, right? Yeah. And so it's important to be, so I can have a, a competent and confident conversation with people. So I think that preparation certainly, uh, certainly did help. And, and like I mentioned earlier, I, I cut my teeth in the broker dealer world, which was more sales focused. And not to say that it was all for naught, there was some great learning experience, but the challenges of for a young guy starting out in a new field that has a athlete identity, people know me as a quarterback, not as a financial quarterback, if you will. And so they're like, hey, I've got $10 million to invest. Why do I want to ultimately, like I, I know you and I trust you, but do you have the qualifications, right? And so for me, it was about putting my head down, staying in business, right? That's the ultimate challenge in our world is like, can you can you get over that first initial hump of making it, right? Yeah. So it's like in the in sports world, you have to make those first two years of cuts, right? Get into year three. Yeah. Um, and so that was my challenge of, okay, hey, I've got to get all my certifications. I want to be not just a guy that has my Series 65. I want to be a, a CFP. I want to have all the certifications that I believe my clients deserve for me to have to take and know, and all, you know, covering all the different areas that I'm gonna be helping them on. Um, and so I think just that daily approach of putting my head down, showing up, being consistent, getting those certifications. And then also, I think it's the frustrations been of like, you talk about losing, right? Or having a setback early in your career. Well, as a young guy, like trying to get that first client, right? It's like, God dang, is this ever gonna happen? Is it yeah. like, I remember my mom just kept encouraging, like, hey, you're gonna be great at this. Like, just just stay at it, stay at it. And then slowly over time, man, you get Virtuosity. that first break. Yeah, there you go. And so you, you've got to set yourself up for success whenever it does rain, right? Yeah. Like, have you prepared your field for the rainfall and, for, and then obviously the, the subsequent harvest? And so I think just being consistent and getting in front of people and then ultimately it started mushroom, right? And it snowball and here we go. And, and, and so, you know, now I'm working with like 60 plus families and I look up and like five years ago I had zero, right? And so uh, it's an incredible blessing and opportunity, but I also know that 
it was the preparation when business was slow that now has set me up for success to be able to differentiate myself in a crowded marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. What's next for you with the company? What are the, what are the big picture goals? Well, the market sell off right now where assets are a little bit down, but yeah. at, at the peak, I think we were right at 600 million. And so our goal is to be at a billion within five years. Um, that's on the, on the current trajectory. I think we had a kegger of about 25% over the last three years. And you know, this year being a little bit down, but we're still, adding a lot of really good clients um, consistently. And so 25% is nothing to sneeze at. And unfortunately for me, as you know, I'm, I'm trying to buy more and more equity of our business, uh, that multiple comes into play because now I'm on the wrong side of that token trying to buy because it drives up the valuation of your company. And so, right. uh, you know, I, I think ultimately though, it's not about the numbers, right? Uh, it's about the people. And right. Sure. So as long as we make the story about the people uh, that we're getting to serve and work with, the rest of the story takes care of itself, right? So it's, I think it's about having the, the, the right focus and lenses of, is really a billion dollars the, the ultimate goal? No, um, it's not. I think it's doing a really dang good job of offering financial planning and investment management services to the clients we currently have and that we're blessed to serve. And then doing a really good job so that they continue to refer people into us. Yeah, and what about, what about personally? Anything happening in your personal life? You know, uh, Talk about challenges right now, Bob. You know what I mean? <laughs> Jeez, old peasy Martha. Jeez, old peasy Martha. Martha. Hey, 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 you got to get them going. Yeah, got to. Baby number one, you know, so everybody was always wondering, like, when are the McGee's going to pop out kids? Are y'all just going to be like the old people that never had kids? Like, you know, everyone's aunt and uncle, but but never parents. And so my wife, she does modeling and real estate. And so I never wanted to put pressure on her because she loves to work and, and, and be productive. But obviously, if it's a model, yeah, baby, like modeling career is gonna slow up quite a bit, right? And uh, not to say there's not opportunities out there for to do pregnancy modeling, but um, I, I wanted her to enjoy her, her career too. And so sure. she, I think was ready. And so that time, like if you're especially gonna have kids, you know, we wanna do it before, it was a little bit late for her. And so here we are and we go into that, that first, uh, that first uh, sonogram, and man, I'm telling you, it, w it was something else. Like you get to hear the heartbeat and hear this baby. I had two goals going into there. Number one, I wanted to know that baby was healthy. Check that box. Yep. Number two, I wanted to know that there was just one in there, not two. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got twins in our neighborhood. There's just too many twins in the water. And so I was nervous. Like, I was like, ah, oh, this is gonna be extremely stressful on me if, if there's two in there. And so so we got a baby girl, number one, due August 7th. And so Congratulations. We're, we're really pumped. Thank you man yeah you it, you're gonna be you're gonna enjoy being a girl dad it is it is a wonderful journey and you're gonna be great at it you're gonna have such a good time it's i'm gonna be a pushover <laughs> my, my wife knows it she's just prepared she's like i'm gonna have to be the disciplinarian i'm gonna be the bad cop all the time because i know you're gonna be a pushover i'm like oh no baby i'll be i'll be i'll be a disciplinarian no i'm not you know me like i am done i love it right any good bull for anybody well my good bull, my my pregnant wife. You know, it's what is it, 104 degrees. Yeah, still got two more months yeah, to go. 100, 100, somewhere between 104 and 140. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it dries a bone. My poor wife, you know, hauling around a, a, another human being, and it's just uh, it's incredible. She's been an absolute trooper. Doesn't complain. She's just and and honestly, way too productive for someone in her state. Like she's just always going. Uh, it's it's talk about mental toughness. Like, what, what were those shirts? When we were player, like it was MTXEs, it wasn't that middle toughness extra oh, effort? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my That's, wife. Yeah, she MTXE, gets an MTXE oh, every day. MTXEs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's just it's it really is incredible the whole experience. And obviously, for me, my life hasn't changed a whole lot yet. But I walked in the business school and it been a, it been a long number of years, and all those memories come back, right? Like the place hasn't changed. Like it, I love that. And we were laughing. I ran into a couple of professors and whatnot that were some people took classes with me and and. Man, it's just like how many different people touched your life whenever I walked into that building. For me, it was just an unbelievable amount. And the one guy that really has scarred me in a great way is Dr. Stephen McDaniel. I think I had him for over 18 hours. So I undergrad, May's business marketing, took master's of science in marketing. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Mack was the guy um, and just, scarred me in such a great way because of his compassion and humility and just he was always kind and was a great listener and slow to speak but yet 
extremely sharp and had so much to share and to offer and wisdom. And yeah. never forget one day in class, um, we were in, uh, it was a master's class and he brought up some point. He's like, hey, we never want to ever lie. And I just kind of chuckled trying to make a joke in front of the class. Like, well, my wife's pregnant. She asked me if, if she looks fat, I'm going to say no. And everyone kind of <laughs> laughed, you know, whatever moved on. But I'll never forget, he kind of he kind of laughed, chuckled. And he said, well, you know, Stephen, even in those moments, there is a way to be gracious and yet not lie, right? Baby, you look amazing. That baby is perfect in your body right now. But we can't, we can't lie. We got, she's got to know that whenever you say something to her, it's hundred percent honest. And I thought to myself, you know what? Like those little simple things like that guard me in a great way. Like, I, why is it that I still remember that 12, 13 years later? Like, but here I am and it's, it stuck with me. So like, even in the simple things of making sure that we're honest and we don't stretch the truth, right? And that's Dr. Mack, man. He's just a, he's a great, great human being that I'm I'm fortunate to have been been around. Good bull to him, yeah. and good bull to your wife, and good bull to you. Thanks for joining great us, to Stephen. See you, buddy. Appreciate having you here. Thank you.